Warning, this video contains spoilers for multiple great episodes and several major events throughout the Star Trek franchise, particularly Enterprise, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Discovery. Before 2016, the ever-changing appearance of Klingons was a bit shaky. Even the Augment virus didn't cover everything, at least not without making some assumptions here and there. But now with Discovery and Lower Decks, any attempt at a cohesive Klingon narrative seems to have been abandoned. Sure, it took Enterprise four seasons and the franchise five series to attempt an explanation, but right now we live in the dark times of Klingons making no sense. Maybe you don't care. Maybe not having continuity really bothers you. Either way, Lower Decks finally pushed me to finalize my Klingon headcanon several months back, and I believe I have come up with a cohesive narrative that not only makes sense, but is adaptable and accounts for all discrepancies in appearances in the timeline. For starters, let's take a look at what I'm going to call the Enterprise Era. This encompasses Enterprise, up to Affliction, and everything back to when the modern Klingon first evolved. In other words, Enterprise is what Klingons are supposed to look like, as there has been no interference in their DNA up until the end of this era. Unfortunately, this makes this era the hardest for me to defend, as I propose that both TNG Klingons and Discovery Klingons exist in this era in unequal proportions. More on that later. I'm also going to treat them as different races as opposed to different species of Klingon, but this theory works if you want to believe they are two species of Klingon as well. Why this has to be the case will become clear later, so for now just assume it's true. But first we will have to address why we never see Disco Klingons in Enterprise. Man, that sentence was way less funky written down than spoken. <laughs> While there are relatively few encounters with Klingons in Enterprise, usually less than 10 at a time, we do occasionally see really official places like the council chamber or a courtroom with crowds of Klingons. So I propose Discovery Klingons are an ethnic minority in the Empire and are furthermore of some sort of lower class, either currently or historically. The council is ruled by great houses, and we hear from both Kor and Martok in Deep Space Nine that nobility and royal blood still mean a lot to the Empire even in the 24th century. Therefore, if Disco Klingons were some sort of peasant or slave class, they would not have been of a royal family, and therefore would have no noble houses in this or any era. Again, I will address Discovery later, so just accept this for now. How much of a minority they are doesn't really matter, so long as it wouldn't be weird to randomly draw a dozen or so Klingons from the Empire and not get a single Discovery Klingon, which is exactly what we see in Enterprise. Also bear in mind that the military and state settings, which is where we see Klingons every time except on Rurapenthe, would bias against or even completely ban such a minority. Of course, towards the end of Enterprise, the Augment Virus happens, just as we see it in the show. No retcons, remember? We, as the audience, don't see a Klingon for nearly a hundred years until Discovery. And in Discovery, we learn the Klingon Empire has been divided for a long time, suggesting the Augment Virus did what Section 31 wanted it to. Therefore, I propose the time between these series encompasses two eras that I will call post-Ent and pre-Discovery. The post-Ent era is pretty simple. The Augment Virus quickly spreads across the Empire and all Klingons become TOS era Klingons in appearance. Given the six or less years between Strange New Worlds and the original series the Klingons will have to change later, this likely happens incredibly quickly. By the time the Federation is founded in 2161, all but the most isolated Klingons have been infected and appear all TOS-like. This completely destabilizes the Empire and divides the Great Houses for the next century. And this is the state of affairs for the next few decades until a point roughly midway between Enterprise and Discovery. To explain the transition from post-Ent to pre-Discovery, I'm going to propose a hypothetical scenario on present-day Earth. Let's say that some freak virus has appeared that turns humans into lizard people and quickly infects everybody. This destabilizes the world a bit, and everything is just worse, because it sucks to be a lizard person. Now you might think that being a lizard person sounds cool, but this is my hypothetical, so I get to say it sucks. Your clothes don't fit, people are laying eggs, and your scales itch all the time. I think this was the plot of Threshold or something, but it just sucks. Our genetic engineering technology is in its infancy, and, like Phlox says in Enterprise, it is about a century behind curing such an affliction. Now, let's assume after a few decades of that, word comes from America. Scientists have made a breakthrough on a cure to make everybody appear human again. However, there is a catch. The cure came through some miracle coincidence, and it turns out that there is some sort of partial immunity carried by American Indians. It didn't prevent them from being infected in the first place, 
but the antivirus and development only seems to work on them. It appears to be due to some combination of the minor differences in the DNA of different ethnicities, but we can't work out exactly what the combination is. Therefore, the only way to turn non-Native Americans back into humans is to alter their DNA to essentially make them completely ethnically Native American. The original DNA will be recorded, and attempts will continue to create a cure for all races, but right now, this is all we have. Now, if you happen to be one of the few who is Native American, then that's great. However, if you aren't, this probably isn't ideal. You won't look like yourself, however, you will at least look human. Maybe your ethnicity is important to you. Maybe you fear losing it will alter your culture. Maybe you're just racist. But you're a lizard person right now, and surely being a different human is better and less damaging to your culture than being a lizard person. In fact, it is. This is my hypothetical. Therefore, the vast majority, if not all people, will go for this option. It shouldn't be hard to see this is what I propose happened to the Klingons. The Native Americans of my scenario, a historically persecuted ethnic minority on the global scale, are the Discovery Klingons. Suddenly, a very small percentage of the population become 100% of the people. Sure, they aren't technically Disco Klingons, ethnically, but as far as their DNA and appearance is concerned, they are. And if you don't think every Klingon would do this, consider that Klingons hate humans. Federation ones probably more so than the United Nations of Earth. We stand for everything they find weak and cowardly, not to mention they probably blame us for what happened, even without knowing about Section 31. And we aren't entirely without blame. Therefore, even to the most racist of Klingons, or the High Council itself, any Klingon is better than being a filthy human. And even if a few Klingons don't become Disco Klingons, then we simply don't see them in Discovery, as there are so few of them, even fewer than the Discovery Klingon under normal circumstances. This event also explains the radical departure in ship design in Discovery. Discovery Klingon ships are ancient. We are explicitly told this multiple times. Klingons are also more religious here than in other series, and in general seem more ancient in culture and appearance. In other words, they look like what you would expect of Klingons in the early days of the Empire or the time of Kaelas. I propose that after this roughly 50 year dip into humanity, there is a strong push to remain Klingon. Oh, what was that? Well, isn't that interesting? The Great Houses abandoned the more functional, basic ships, such as the D series and Bird of Prey slash Raptors and pull their proud and ancient vessels out of the equivalent of a hall of warriors for ships. They destroy or mothball their Enterprise-era fleet and go back to the traditional and old ways which are seen as more Klingon. Skipping ahead a bit, after they lose the war with the Federation, to attempted genocide, let's not forget, there's probably greater respect towards humans from Klingons. We know Lorel has no such bias against humanity, and the old ships, without the now obsolete cloaks, are probably worse than the more modern ones anyways. The old ships lost them the war, probably the first loss in literal ages, and they just scream non-functionality. I don't care if you love them or hate them, but there are like zero bridge stations on the bridge of the Ship of the Dead. Plus, they are cavernous, take ages to build, and are made of flipping stone. And every lost ship is a huge loss of a treasured house heirloom. The loss of the Ship of the Dead must have been huge culturally. Imagine literally flying the Eiffel Tower or Taj Mahal into war. Therefore, when the Rel is looking for new ships, she looks back at the blueprints for the D6, which is not a ship we see, but one we know must exist, and Raptors, and invents the D7, continuing the natural Klingon ship evolution formed by every other series, and even adding an era before it. And before you rush to the comments, I know a D7 kidnapped Lorca in Season 1, but we also see Lorel announce the quote, new D7 class in Season 2. So if your series is gonna retcon itself, I can't really fix that. Maybe if it was a prototype or a computer glitch or a massive coincidence and the Federation calls Klingon ship classes D number. Anyways, this period of rebuilding a Klingon identity is what I call pre-discovery. There's not much else to talk about the Discovery era itself, except that around the time Discovery jumps into the 32nd century, the Augment virus mutates into a superbug of itself, which may or may not have anything to do with Section 31. Your choice, really, but I don't like it personally. This superbug, real concept, look it up, is immune to the antivirus that worked on Discovery-era Klingons, and everybody rapidly becomes a TOS Klingon again. Now, 
By the time TOS actually starts in seven years' time, not everybody has to be a TOS Klingon. They don't appear that often, and usually only one battalion at a time. So let's say that if one member of a Klingon battalion is infected, then the whole battalion will soon be affected too. What's important is that, again, enough Klingons have to be infected that it isn't unusual every Klingon we see in Toss and Tass is a TOS-era Klingon. Likewise, not every Klingon has to be Discovery-era in Strange New Worlds if that show chooses to go that direction. Just enough in the right areas. This TOS era at least partially covers Toss and Tass because we very quickly need to transition into the TMP era only three years after Tass. The TMP era, consisting of the first six movies plus a few years, contains what I like to call proto-Klingons. They look a lot like TNG Klingons, but their forehead ridges are still a bit underdeveloped and generally look a bit off compared to TNG to Enterprise Klingons. I propose that the reassertion of the Augment virus after Discovery led to increased measures to counteract its effects. Technology has also improved enough, as predicted by Phlox, that a general cure comes relatively quickly, likely sometime during year four or five of the Enterprise's mission. After its creation, the cure is rapidly spread throughout the Empire. It still takes a few years, as Klingons aren't exactly famous for their healthcare system, and Klingons outside the Empire, like the ones the Enterprise encounters, are probably some of the last to get the vaccine due to simple proximity. However, this cure takes time to show itself, as Klingons literally have to regrow their cranial ridges, lose that extra human reproductive organ, all that good stuff. The cure could even work in stages, slowly restoring a Klingon's true appearance. This is why we don't see any true TNG Klingons by the Undiscovered Country, 18 years after we see the first proto-Klingon in the motion picture. Now you may ask, if their appearance is being restored, why don't we see any Discovery Klingons? That's because the Augment Virus is still a superbug, but a superbug specifically adapted to the Discovery Klingons. Think about it. The virus hasn't seen a TNG Klingon in over a century. It has been exclusively living in Disco Klingons, because that's the only Klingon the Empire could make. The same luck that allowed Discovery Klingons to re-emerge before any other race is the same luck that would condemn them to nearly an extra 200 years of being the wrong ethnicity externally. This leads us into the TNG era, which consists of everything after the motion picture era through the run of Deep Space Nine, but not Voyager. More on that later. This entire era consists entirely of TNG Klingons. Incidentally, this gives us plenty of time for people to not know about TOS-era Klingons in Trials and Tribulations, especially if our new Klingon allies ask us to not teach that embarrassing part of their history and to use modified photos of historical figures in school. Heck, make that part of the Kitamura Accords if you want. That way, Dax knows she's not supposed to talk about TOS-era Klingons if that bothers you. We now enter what I'm going to call the Lower Decks Plus era. This consists of everything after Deep Space Nine and into Infinity. In this era, Klingons have finally found a workaround for the superbug version of the Augment Virus, and they can restore every single Klingon to what they would have looked like had generations been allowed to naturally reproduce without the Augment Virus. We know what that would be thanks to the records I mentioned way back at the start of this video. This allows us to see both type of Klingons in Lower Decks, Picard if they want to show Klingons, and Discovery. But why were they able to cure the virus now? Simple. The Dominion War. The Founders are masters at genetic engineering, and the Starfleet Klingon Romulan Alliance has been able to study their work. Bashir watched a Jem'Hadar grow from a baby, the Federation had a Vorta prisoner for a few months, and Bashir could study both the morphogenic virus and the genetically engineered patients from the Institute, not to mention himself. In other words, both powers have had several amazing opportunities to study advanced genetic engineering over the course of a few short years. If you want to take it a step further, the Klingons could have insisted the Dominion help cure their people of a 300-year-old virus as part of the peace treaty. Heck, Odo would probably be willing to help with that now that he's a pile of goo again. Finally, I also think it's worth pointing out that the Mirror Universe should never have had an Augment Virus. The Terran Empire would have no need to destabilize the Klingon Empire as... Well, they destabilized Kronos. And we see both Discovery and TNG Klingons in the Mirror Universe, but no TOS Klingons. I'd also like to note the two sleeper Klingon groups from the TOS era in TNG and Voyager. The group of frozen Klingons, as well as those people who want to make baby Paris Taurus space Jesus. Both groups left around the TMP era, 
with enough wiggle room to reasonably say both received the cure that made everyone a TNG Klingon before leaving the Empire. This way, they would have plenty of time for the antivirus to show its effects over the decades by the time they show up in their respective episodes. What I really enjoy about this theory is that it's pretty adaptable to new series like Strange New Worlds. While they might put pressure on some of the time frames we have for a virus to spread, the discrepancies can be chalked up to the balance of virus versus cure, and exactly who can be cured. We may have some trouble if Discovery chooses to only show us loads of Discovery Klingons moving forward, but given the efforts they took in Season 2 to make Klingons look more like they used to, as well as their appearances in Lower Decks and the promise to keep Worf as he was in TNG if he ever shows up in Picard, I think a mix of both races is the most likely moving forward. Also, I've just finished reading the script, but it's come to my mind that the Klingons in the 2009 films, the JJ films, they could simply look different because they got a partial cure, maybe from the advanced technology of the Kelvin or the jellyfish ship, or even the Narada, I suppose. Or just given the general technology advancements of that universe, they could have just been better and partially cured it easier. Maybe even augmented themselves, who knows? I always explain that away as another universe.